right, so this is part B uh, of Lesson 26. Charles II and the Restoration of the Monarchy. Charles II will return to England. He's going to be charming and politic, which basically means that he knows how to talk to people and get kind of what he wants without upsetting them too much. He will uh, rule over an England that will be reset to monarchy. We'll have the Anglican Church back with the Episcopalian system and a parliament that only meets when the king summons them. And so it's, it's pretty much like it was before the Civil War. But here's the deal. He has secret Catholic sympathies. He favored religious tolerance. And this is going to be something people will be suspicious about. Uh, he couldn't do anything about the ultra-royalist Clarendon Code. It's kind of ironic. These are folks who are friends, essentially, of uh, him. They support the monarchy. But they get this Clarendon Code through which excludes Catholics and Presbyterians and Congregationalists, or also known as Independents, from official life. Uh, so municipal officials had to take Anglican Communion. This is something that definitely uh, Catholics couldn't do. Um, the Act of Uniformity was established again. There would be no conventicles. Uh, of, of, that means people couldn't gather in groups of six or more and, and kind of talk religion. And Nonconformist ministers uh, had to deal with a five-mile act. They couldn't go to towns. They had to stay, in fact, five miles away from towns. And, or, and they couldn't go uh, within five miles of places that they used to study, so to speak. So this was designed to keep them from being able to spread their faith. And he, here we see the fellow who's kind of blamed for the Clarendon Codes, but he wasn't really that interested. His name is Clarendon, but he didn't even like everything in it. In 1670, we have the Treaty of Dover. This is an Anglo-French alliance versus the Dutch. There is a secret portion of this alliance. Charles II pledges that he will become Catholic when it is politically possible to be so in England. And Louis XIV promises him a subsidy. So here we see on the left, we see uh, Louis XIV. And in the middle, we see the, f the poor fellow who's uh, trying to protect the Dutch lands, Netherlands, William III. Well, he'll be William III of England later, but right now he's just William of Orange. And then to the right we see good old Charles II. Charles II will learn his limits, though. Charles II issues the Declaration of Indulgence in 1672, which tries to suspend discriminatory, discriminatory laws against Catholics and non-Anglicans. Parliament will refuse to fund his war, so he has to give up on this declaration of an indulgence. Uh, and the Test Act will be passed by Parliament. Officials now will have to, to uh, swear an oath against tra transubstantiation. And this was aimed at James, who is Charles' brother, who will probably become the next king. Then in 1678, we have the Titus Oates plot, the Popish plot. The, this is uh, a situation where the opposition in Parliament, the Whigs, will try to ban James as an heir, all because of this supposed plot to execute Charles II, uh, involving Charles II's wife and his brother, supposedly. Um, and uh, this is not something Charles II is particularly happy about. Here we see a, a illustration. It's a, it's a playing card. Somebody made playing cards back in, in, in this time period over the Popish plot. Charles II will increase customs duties and, and get aid from uh, Louis XIV so that he can dismiss Parliament. And once he dismisses Parliament, he represses those Whigs. He you know, puts a lot of these guys in prison, executes some of them for treason, that kind of thing. And then we get to the Glorious Revolution. James II will become the new king of England. He is the brother of Charles II. He will challenge local authority. Uh, he, he will uh, demand the repeal of the Test Act. He will dissolve Parliament and appoint Catholic officials. And in 1687, he will bring that Declaration of Indulgence back up. And he will imprison seven Anglican bishops. So he'll do all these things that are really going to tick off Protestants in England. 
Now the English hoped that James would be succeeded by Mary. But in June 20th, James II has a son born by his Catholic wife. And this is just too much for the Protestants in Parliament. They're, they had to deal with all these religious conflicts uh, involving kings and queens of England for quite some time now. And they want to end this problem. And they don't want to end it by be going back to Catholicism. So these Protestants in Parliament, the Whigs especially, they'll invite William III, who is William of Orange at this point, to invade from the Netherlands to preserve what they call traditional liberties. So here we see a picture of uh, William of Orange's army coming up on, uh, you know, on, on board ships, transports, uh, and his navy. And uh, they will arrive in November of 1688. There won't be much opposition. James will flee to France. In 1689, uh, the new monarchs, William and Mary, will issue the Bill of Rights, the English Bill of Rights, that will provide civil liberties to the privileged classes. Not to everybody, but the privileged classes. This is, establishes a precedent that the monarchs rule by the consent of Parliament. One of the things they establish is that no Catholics be eligible to the throne. This solves the problem, essentially, for Parliament, uh, Protestant members of Parliament. From now on, we're, we're just not going to deal with it. If somebody becomes a Catholic, they can't be king or queen of England. The Toleration Act of 1689 will be passed. This will allow for tolerance for Protestant worship, but it will outlaw Catholic worship, and anybody who denies the Trinity will be outlawed. So as long as you are a Trinitarian and you're not a Catholic, you will be tolerated. This does not mean that uh, there are no limits whatsoever on Protestants who ha don't happen to be Anglican, but they, they're allowed to worship uh, in their own churches and so on. The Act of Settlement 1701 allowed Hanovers, the House of Hanover, which is uh, one of these Palatine states in uh, Germany, the Holy Roman Empire, or what's left of it anyway, to succeed Anne, who was queen for a little while. The reason we don't talk much about her is because not a whole lot of, of significance happened during her reign, which is probably a good thing as far as the people during Anne's reign. And then the Act of Union will happen. 1707, England and Scotland will be combined. There have been other sorts of acts, if you will, to make this official, but this is where it really kind of is cemented. The Act of Union, 1707, England and Scotland combined become Great Britain. Of course, this includes Wales as well. But not Ireland. Now we get to the age of Walpole. The age of Walpole. So George I uh, is going to become this new Hanoverian dynasty. He's going to be the first king. And uh, James Edward Stuart, the son of James II, will try to come back with an army and get rid of this, what he considers pretender. Which is interesting because his, his uh, what people in Britain who don't want the Stuarts to come back call him as the old pretender. Um, and this happens in 1715, but still under George I, things aren't really that smooth until Walpole becomes his prime minister in 1721. Now, why is, are things going to be stable? Well, one, he has the support of George I, and everybody knows it. And he knows how to handle the House of Commons, and he controls patronage effectively. So what happens is peace will be maintained. Uh, the domestic status quo that's in place will be promoted. Foreign trade will be promoted. Walpole will respect local authority. And this means that the aristocracy will support the government and they will serve in the military and direct the military. So things are going to run smoothly as a result. The interesting thing about this time period is there's a great deal of public debate, which is not something you see too much of in Europe at the time. Uh, newspapers will, will come up. This is a, a picture here of the Daily Quran uh, that uh, started in 1702 and the 
is a historical claim by some that it's the, basically the first newspaper in Europe. There's a, a, a reasonable amount of free speech and free association. There's no real large standing army in England, although they have a really large navy. And uh, there's significant religious toleration. It becomes a model for all progressive Europeans and, frankly, for Americans. If you paid attention in this, you heard things like religious toleration. You heard about petition of right an English Bill of Rights, the idea of a political assembly that is able to check the power of, of the executive figure, in this case a king, and all these things are very similar to some of the ideas that are going to pop up that lead to the American Revolution. In fact, many of these ideas, many of the arguments made during the civil English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution will be studied by our founding fathers in this country.